and take it away. Okay, everybody, thanks so much for joining us. Our movie this evening was Svetlana Boim. We hope you enjoyed it. I will remind you that tomorrow night is the grand finale of the 10th Annual Gainesville Film Festival, uh, and the film will be All See, which I'm sure everyone um, will enjoy. Uh, our speaker for tomorrow night is our newest faculty member, Roy Holler. So I hope that everyone can be there. Hey, Roy. Um, but tonight, uh, to discuss about Lana Boyne, I'm uh, very pleased to introduce our colleague, Dragan Kuyunzic uh, from the Center for Jewish Studies. Um, Dragan uh, is truly the right person to discuss this film. He has published a great deal of scholar, scholarly material in the disciplines of history, philosophy, literature, and film. And he is published in English, Russian, and Serbian. Uh, he is also an experienced filmmaker whose recent work has been screened in numerous prestigious venues throughout the US and Europe, from the US Holocaust Memorial Museum to the British Library to institutions such as Yale and the University of Chicago. Uh, his, his interest even within disciplines is wide ranging from pivotal French literary critics uh, such as Jacques Derrida to the German Jewish philosopher Walter Benjamin to more recent figures such as the Russian filmmaker Alexander Sokolov. Um, so uh, without further ado, uh, Dragan, thank you. Lead us uh, in a discussion of this film, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Norm, I welcome you all, myself, on behalf of the Center for Jewish Studies at the University of Florida. And I welcome you to the Gainesville Film Festival and to the discussion of the film about the life and work of Svetlana Boyne. This is for me a bittersweet task. Svetlana Boyne was a friend for over 25 years. And it is impossible to speak about her work uh, without pangs of mourning. She left us on August 5th, 2015, at the age of 56. As Masha Gessen, also a mutual friend to whom Svetlana introduced me many years ago in Moscow, wrote two days after Svetlana's passing away in the Atlantic, many lives ended on August 5th. Svetlana was truly a multitude of talents and luminous persona. It is also hard to speak about a film about Svetlana Boy. If the work of art carries an aura as Benjamin taught us, then the oracity of this film about Svetlana pales in comparison with the aura cast by Svetlana Boy. Svetlana, so to speak, outshines the light of the medium or is the aura of this film itself. She demands that I speak about her as much as I need to speak about the film. Please allow me thus a few personal reminiscences and a very telegraphic reflection of her work in order to open a discussion and invite you to participate. Svetlana, as you could see from the film, for those of you who are meeting her first in this medium, was a brilliant intellectual, an amazingly talented photographer, but also incredibly warm person with a great sense of humor. Since I'm addressing you under the auspices of the Center for Jewish Studies and the North Central Florida Jewish Council, please allow me a Yiddishism. Svetlana was truly a mensch. I met Svetlana first at Harvard University at the very beginning of our careers. She was just recently appointed assistant professors, professor and I was invited for my very first job talk. Imagine a room, five or six Harvard professors, all men, needless to say. Since then, Harvard and the Slavic department have changed as Bill Todd said in the film, and as is well known, is filled now by great young scholars, many women, including, and I'm um, uh, glad to welcome Julie Buckler from Harvard, 
who is joining us tonight. So many, many women, many great young scholars, but that path no doubt opened up by Svetlana Boyne. And next to that group dominated by these men, from them comes to me this petite young woman. Svetlana was petite, but she filled the room with her radiant personality, walks across the room towards me and hugs me as a welcome, never having met me before. Svetlana, an assistant professor, shows her endorsement at the time when no one got tenured at Harvard, as Bill Todd says, said courageously crossing the room, a mesh. Svetlana knew what it meant to be a stranger in a strange land, what it was to be to interview at the beginning of one's career in that setting, better than anyone. She broke many uh, a glass ceiling at Harvard. We had then since become friends, met at professional venues, met at conferences, hung out in Moscow several summers in a row. Uh, these, uh, these, uh, these memories are filled with, uh, with Svetlana's, with sense of Svetlana's humor. humor. They were intellectual adventures into post-communist Moscow. I feel privileged that I had a chance in my life to explore Russia with Sveta Boyan. The last time we met at Columbia University, we had a lunch at the Upper West Side. You saw Svetlana's presentation from that event in the film. We talked about our careers. And now at this kind of latter stage, both of us in an uncanny coincidence turned to media making films and to Jewish studies. Svetlana was an intellectual and as an artist, a consummate despotic traveler, a person, I quote, to whom the entire world is a foreign land, to use a quote much liked by another great comparatist, Erich Auerbach. He considered such a person, a person to whom the entire world is a foreign land, to be a perfect person. In her photography, she explored those realms with an artist, I quote from Svetlana's um, own um, uh, writing, when an artist crosses the border illegally and like the diasporic repo man, try to repossess what used to belong to them, reconquer the space of art, end of quote. As a philosopher of modernity, in her books, spanning from Russian modernism to Hannah Arendt, she was relentlessly exploring exilic realms which surpassed the boundaries of their language and cultural context. That diasporic excess was her favorite milieu. Svetlana was always off to use her concept of off modern, I quote, as in off stage, off key, off beat, and occasionally off color, as she wrote in her manifesto of off mother. I would also add off the boat, always embarking and discovering new territories, working, living, and writing for strangeness, as she once wrote. Svetlana Boim left us too early with errands to continue now without her, but having left us an opus worthy of many lives. With an infinite task, to paraphrase the same text by Svetlana Boim, to constantly return to her work, unlearn and love, not possessively, but tenderly, inconstantly, and desperately. I welcome you again, and I open the floor for your discussion, questions, reminiscences, or observations. Thank you. If you have any associations of the film, or if you wish to share memories of Svetlana or um, 
just how this film impressed you, if this is your first encounter with Svetlana's work or personality. Now, please feel free to speak. I got yeah. yeah, I, I was uh, among the things that struck me in watching the film <clears throat> was um, some of her relationships. Obviously, I mean, uh, but um, one of them, of course, was with uh, Komar. Is Komar Komar. Komar, yes, you know, and I I knew <laughs> uh, Komar's part of Komar and, and uh, the no, I mean. <laughs> it was uh, my among my favorite modern artists. Yeah. So, uh, she, she, she was, she, you know, was admired by the, some of the leading uh, such artists like Omar Melamid. Um, she wrote about their work, but also exhibited with them or curated their work. Svetlana was really many. She curated exhibits, mm -hmm. she, you know, so, uh, and has a certain affinity with such art. I would say she does come from that milieu, but, um, she also moves it to um, a direction of this kind of offbeat, off the beaten path, wow. uh, explorations of modernism, cracks in modernity uh, left uh, by her experience of exile and immigration, <laughs> which she shows uh, this uncanny superimposition uh, where she herself reflects that she photographed things throughout her life. And then she visits this, uh, uh, camp the, uh, where she was a transition camp from Soviet Union to the United States near Vienna. And all of a sudden she realizes by superimposing that these are the walls of the camp where she was for several months, where I think six months that she lived there that, that followed her throughout her life in completely an uncanny kind of superimposition of her vision of the world. <laughs> this is an amazing, you know, you know, coincidence, but also the lucidity to understand and integrate that in her thinking and, and filming and making pictures, right? That, that uh, testifies to uh, talent of a photo photo photographer, but also to, to her own lucidity uh, of reading her own art, right? So I'll ask you a question then. Yeah. So the, her, her, her preoccupation with the off, uh, uh, goes very nicely with uh, the sense of humor of uh, yeah. Komar Malamud, mm -hmm. and uh, and so you know it just struck me as the um, how humorous she was, uh, her love for humor. You know? she, she was she was amazing. You know, uh, as a person, when I remember our encounters, it was always humorous, joyous, you know, jouissant, very happy. When I watch her pictures and when I see her in film, I sense a certain anguish. You know, mm -hmm. pictures reveal a certain anguish, which I think she tried to overcome and conquer with that constant humor, you know, this kind of wits and its relation to the unconscious, to quote Freud. You know, she was always in that kind of humorous, jocular distance to her, even when she was very serious. And thus, this humor kind of permeates and infuses her writing, but also it's a, it's a, it's also in her photographs, right? In these kind of mistakes, in these kind of parataxis in seeing the world, like these mistakes in seeing, right? These kind of <laughs> errors, or uh, as she writes in this um, uh, text about off modern, about this kind of. Um, errancies, or Derrida called the destined errancies, like uh, uh, arriving to a wrong place, right? This kind of being amused at arriving to a wrong place constantly. And that kind of uh, arrival uh, to a wrong place constitutes your, your journey, right? That's um, the letter which never came to its destination. That was her kind of sense, but that is that was uh, what kind of uh, was the sense of that humorous self perception, right? That she's off wherever she was, and kind of amused by that. But of course, she was very grounded and 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 uh, in terms of thinking, very weighty thinker. So she was a serious thinker of modernism, but but in that thought, she allowed herself these distances which are so brilliantly captured in this film. 
Um, Durgan, I was, uh, one of the many things that struck me in the documentary was about this interest in, I think it was like technology that doesn't work. Um, and it, it actually reminded me a little bit of the point in the film where I think when she first visited a graduate student, a graduate school professor, um, she said she was interested in Spanish literature and the professor was saying like something feels a little off with her biography and it just seemed like like it, it was almost a approach of whatever works. Like she thought Spanish would be her way into, I guess, an, an intellectual life. She, but, but then she hears that th this woman is Russian and she realizes, all right, I can take that path instead. Um, but it was very, it just, it's, it seemed to say a lot about her. Um, Please allow me just to interrupt you before answering. Um... Uh, to say that Yuri Goldberg, Svetlana's father, has joined us. And I welcome him to this. Uh, oh, well, welcome. 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 Um, so yes, not only she, she went to talk, she, she, she lived this multiple persona. She had several um, uh, Facebook pages. She had several to fit all, but she needed that to fit her, all her luminous, brilliant, many talents. She was a writer, she had the novel. She uh, lived these, uh, um, uh, you know, um, artistic identifications with, uh, you know, sometimes Greta Garbo, Ninochka was the film she wrote a, a book about. Uh, she was Olga Kar on occasions. Um, she invented herself as, a, and I'm sorry, Yuri, as a daughter of a, a, a Spanish Civil War fighter, and that is the story she told to the Spanish professor at I think at Boston University. She says, "I'm a daughter of a Spanish War fighter," and this professor thought, "No, this is not, it's impossible." And that's why I said, "No, no, actually, I'm not." Oh, okay. But since she's a Russian, that was fine, right? This kind of imagination was okay for a Russian Jewish woman in Boston. I mean, so, I guess it, it was a little bit of the immigrants, you know, just kind of trying to find a path forward. It's, it seemed like she, she sort of had to do that and, and was good at it. Uh, you know, I think it was the sense that what she says that there was deposited multiple paths of existence where you move between. She said uh, something very beautiful, I think it's quoted in the film, uh, that your, let's say, uh, um, the place from which you emigrated, you cannot return to, right? There is that kind of impossibility of, and thus nostalgia, but uh, nostalgia for a place that maybe never was, as she used to say, because she's also a great philosopher of nostalgia. Has, she has a landmark book on, on nostalgia. Um, but that uh, existence continues parallel to you. You know, you, you left, but there is someone living there <laughs> in, in your place. And you can on occasion glance or maybe move back to that kind of parallel existence, and then you, and that informed her that that is the ability for her to uh, inhabit all this persona, but never as a possession of, a, of an identity, but as an exploration, right? As a kind of parallel coexistence and exploration, um, and that with which she kind of uh, inhabited in with with this lightness, with this kind of. Um, amazing kind of ability to humor or with humor to interpret it to you know just move in the world like that i know very few people who, who I, I never met anybody who was like that at the same time she was very just she was very in a singular way she was attentive to friends to colleagues you know there was nothing um uh, you know superficial about that uh, she was very grounded and attentive in a singular way uh, in her friendship and in her ethics. But that was the way she lived, right? She inhabited the world with this lightness um, and which, with humorous exploration of these various uh, impossibilities, like possibilities and impossibilities, arriving constantly at these various destinations and very often um, erring, not coming to the right place, right? And thus a need to invent, to 
that is my impression, you know, uh, from what I remember of her, right? That she always, and as, as uh, Marsha Gessen said, she had uh, many, many lives. She lived many parallel lives. Um, and she lived as, you know, she trem wrote tremendous amount and, and had so many achievements that this is just amazing, right? As he said in the film, in 10 years, she went from being a guide in St. Petersburg, sp speaking sp Spanish guide, to professor at Harvard. Um, she, was, she was amazingly productive and also came to her with the lightness, but of course, with the tremendous work as well. I know only one person like that, and that was Jacques Derrida, who was as productive and as, as intense in his, um, both in his work and his attention to others as, as Esveta was. Do you um, have any? I will ask. Uh, Rory, yes, please. So uh, I was just wondering about the, the title of the film, Exile and Imagination. Um, I, I was fascinated by her uh, story of, of moving to the United States, maybe because I found a little bit of myself in there. Uh, kind of growing up in a different country and so you know watching all those mm. tremendous films about America and about you know I grew up in Israel where you turn right you're at the in the sea you turn left you're at the border right there's there's no room and um, but I so I, I you know I, I know that this these journeys bring you know bring freedoms but also disappointments um, so I, I wanted to ask according to your uh, our relationship with Svetlana do you think she found her place? Do you think the, uh, uh, perhaps why the reason for the use of the word exile in, in the title of the film? Well, I think I, I tried to respond already about this exilic condition and uh, uh, living in the world, which is always strange, a little bit off, right? In order to explore it, never mm -hmm. allowing herself to arrive to a certainty, right? To a, something, you know, which would be called identity. Right? She was right. writing against this uh, appropriations of, of a certain identity. So in that sense, always kind of on the go and, and exploring. Uh, but at the same time, she was very grounded, kind of very uh, much at ease wherever she was at the same time, yeah. having this immense affinity to, to whatever space she occupied, right? So she, she would be um, uh, in, in a dialogue, so to speak, with a gr showing great affinity to whatever uh, space, cultural, artistic she entered, um, excelling in it, right? Better than anybody, um, but not, appropriate, so it, uh, not appropriating it for some kind of ultimate uh, mm -hmm. goal or achievement or product, right? It was always a stage in this, infinite movement of mind, of uh, body in the world, which explores and finds itself marveling all the time through this, and by using these prosthetic devices, mm -hmm. multiplying it. Um, she has a very beautiful series of images uh, uh, dedicated uh, to Jacques Derrida on his passing away called Touching Writing. Uh, it is in the, uh, uh, rep rep reproduced in the off manifesto. Very, very beautiful. So this kind of tactility and, and, uh, and writing, but always on the cusp of disappearance or moving away or arriving at the wrong destination or on an inherent destination, right? You, you go somewhere uh, with it, but you, you touch it, you, but not quite, right? But through these prosthetic devices, uh, the series that is uh, that is in the film was published in Diacritics. I had uh, again. This is a, 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 a one of these coincidences in life. Uh, I published in Diacritics, uh, which was which was illustrated by by that series of of water that Svetlana that is reproduced in the film. And I am uh, also uh, giving a shout to Diana Barrett Brown, who was at the time editor managing editor of Diacritics who published uh, Svetlana's um, images. 
uh, and I published my essay on um, Alexander Sokurov and the transcript of my film. So we met posthumously uh, in the space of the journal, uh, completely, you know, uh, unbeknownst to me. We, we, we were put together in that journal. And of course, I dedicated my, my essay to her memory. Um, so yes, so that is, but to go back to your question, she, she was, you know, at home in the United States, but she was nowhere. Uh, uh, but the space in which she was at home was always uh, open to this reinterpretation and disappropriations, unlearning, right? Uh, distancing, uh, estrangement. Um, she was also, you know, uh, uh, she started her career, and that is a coincidence with mine, on uh, in reading Russian uh, modern, early Russian modernism. She, Mayakovsky, I wrote my dissertation on Yuri Tinyanov, where from come the concept of uh, estrangement, right? Literature as a, a kind of this kind of machine of estrangement of the world, right? And that was, I think, very uh, influential and left a mark on, on Sveta. That, that kind of conceptually, she was very, that, that, that she had that affinity. With, with early modernism. But of course, she didn't have the ideological baggage that went with Russian modernism of the 20s, but she had that sensibility, right? She learned from Markovsky, uh, Russian uh, formalists and so on. Um, um, on that note, can you speak a little bit to her theoretical genealogy? Because to a large extent, she's very attracted to and lives in those high heady days of French theory. And like Barthes, like Derrida, like Foucault, Foucault. He also, he's also compelled to go through Mallarmé, who's on yeah. our advisor's bookshelf behind. So I just wanted to see what you thought, why the attraction, we know that moment, um, yeah. and, and how it comes out in the work. And just as an aside, you know, obviously I knew the passage on Mallarmé, however, the visual work really struck me. And to a large extent, she goes beyond that genealogy. So if you could speak to that. Well, you spoke very well already, uh, Gail, to, you know, you already formulated that very well. I would have nothing to say. What is interesting, you know, Svetlana Boim came from Russia where, you know, there, nobody taught, there was practically no philosophy, uh, 20th century philosophy in Soviet Union, right? Um, they, the, the reading of, of Russian, French philosophers was very limited and, uh, prohibited, right? Or any other philosophy than the mainstream at the time when she emigrated. Today it's different, right? Um, Let me reformulate that so you know. Okay. What did she find in them? What do you think that, that, that she found? But I would say, I, I'm, I'm getting there. So, you know, she comes to the United States and reads De La Grammatologie. Nobody gives it to her, she just <laughs> reads. And, and she herself about, she didn't quite understand, but she understood the tone. The tone of this kind of humorous, uh, lucid distance, off, off. off distance of Derrida's grammatology and off grammatology, off, you could, you, she, you, you could rename it and retranslate De La Grammatology as precisely as off grammatology. Uh, um, the same with Bart. The same, Bart, of course, appealed to her, no doubt, with his Bart par Bart, uh, with his own kind of playful uh, self reinvention in his, his in his own work um, and photography of himself, not the, the ones he took, but that, that were taken of <laughs> of him, and Michel Foucault for various reasons as well. The work of Foucault influenced and inspired her to write about the death of the author. Right, so she engaged with the death of the author in her doctoral dissertation. So once she uh, uh, overcame that initial um, kind of not, not understanding, she appropriated that she understood very well Derrida and uh, stayed with, with his uh, thought throughout her career. Um, uh, so, um, she, she uh, then integrated that in her work, but the initial kind of uh, encounter was, was that of a marvel, right? That this is possible, right? How, how, how is it possible to write like this? Um, 
I, th I think uh, the, if, if you ask me about the, with, with of, the, of those three, from Bach, she got probably Bach by Bach, Bach the, the you know, autobiographical kind of self-parodic biography of, of Holland Bach. But from Derrida, she got the sense of spectrality. And I think this touching writing series, which she dedicated to Derrida, is, is, is channeling this kind of sense of the writing as trace or photography as trace for uh, seeing things which are on the verge of disappearance, right? They are in these crevices between visible and invisible. That's, uh, that's one of her, the great sensibility of whatever is there to be photographed is, is, is spectral it, and it's uh, enmeshed with the very production of this photography with the prosthetic device itself, right? Photographic camera, which creates these nether worlds and she thematizes that uh, with these um, pictures of uh, uh, a, a dew on, on, on glass or a, little, uh, a bit of rain on glass or uh, these distorted images, uh, reflections, um, or superimpositions, errors, mistakes, as Rachel uh, asked me in the beginning, I think. Mistakes, errors, right, in the production of the image itself. She has this f f amazing f picture of a building in Sarajevo, which looks as if it's blown up with a kind of wound opened by a, 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 a you know, propelled rocket or something, you know, filmed in post uh, now war Sarajevo, but the, the building was intact, but the, 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 this kind of wound, red wound, this kind of exploded facade is actually a mistake. She superimposed by mistake one previous image on that uh, picture of a facade in Sarajevo and thus creating actually the truth of the, of the, of the image of the political and historical condition of Sarajevo through this mistake, arriving to the wrong, wrong address uh, with her work and yet hitting uh, the spot. So in that sense, this kind of off um, sense of uh, disappearance, sense of trace, which is on the verge of disappearance and the arriving at places due to the mistake of filming or Photographing is something that I think she, she shared with Derrida's sense of destinerance, right? Coming to a wrong place um, in your destination, in your writing or in your existence. Dragan, I, I was wondering if I could um, ask something, not having known her personally, but, but having read the Svetlana Boim a lot. Um, I mean, there's another dimension to this being off, um, and that is, uh, you, you know, it's it's the baggage, it's the the shame of coming from the Soviet Union at the time. Um, it's it's having to disguise your identity or not even having an identity as a Jew in the Soviet Union first, and then coming here with the with the baggage and the burden of a of a of a of a country that you know cannot properly be named even. Yeah. at the time when she comes um and so uh, so being so I, I mean to me it's not strange at all that she invents herself as a as a daughter of a spanish republican uh because in that case she has a she has a narrative that's interesting that you know can kind of be appropriately western but sufficiently off so that she can yeah. relate to it so in that sense i think it's different you know, it's different than coming from Israel. Um, yeah, absolutely. And so I, I'm, um, I'm, I'm wondering to what degree that was, uh, uh, because when I read her nostalgia, it's, it's the work on nostalgia um, and the work on exile, it's really also about a nostalgia that's a priori disavowed. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's absolutely. A nostalgia that you're not allowed to have here because how can you have a nostalgia for a place that should not exist in the first place. Uh, and so she works around it in, in two different ways. In one, which is kind of bringing out from that, you know, legacy um, of Russia, yeah. things that cannot be disavowed. No. Uh, and then also by distinguishing between different kinds of nostalgia, some of which are allowed and some of which are not allowed. 
Well, um, and so I want. I, I was wondering if you could speak to that shame. But um, you, you, coming. you spoke very eloquently to that. I wouldn't have anything to add except that to say that as far as nostalgia is concerned, Svetlana was very much aware that this can be also a very dangerous political uh, concept, right? The, the nostalgia for something concrete that you can reappropriate. Nostalgia, it was a feeling she would not necessarily disavow, but would uh, use with caution, right? Precisely, selectively. Take from the Soviet Union that which is worth redeeming and uh, she wrote lovingly about communal apartments, about little, you know, matryoshkas. You know, she had great affinity with that space. She channels it in her work. But at the same time, she was very wary of the ideological and political background uh, from which she came. She, she, yes, there was a sense that, uh, and that I also interpret that anguish, which is captured in camera sometimes, as that sense of this exilic condition uh, is also um, something that uh, uh, was caused by political, uh, you know, trajectory she she had. Right, uh, she was off and out from the outside looking in. Um, I remember, so I, I cannot speak of the shame, you know, that would be something that Svetlana, that, that should be discerned now, carefully read in her work, whether she, I don't think she had nothing to be shamed of, but um, she certainly could feel that things should not be like that, Savapa, right? Should, we shouldn't, she, it, she, it's, 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 it's a great injustice that she had to be, right? But she did. Um, This is something that is familiar to us coming from the former Yugoslavia, right? We cannot name the country, right, Aida? In the eyes of nationalists. No, exactly. No, I mean, but, uh, but, but we, even our loss was different. Okay, I mean, we, no, we, absolutely, we, yeah. But we don't have to. We don't have to. Um, we 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 come with different um, absences of absences of excuses for the place from which we come. No. Um, I think coming from the Soviet Union was very similar. There is this lovely story by Mrozek uh, mm -hmm. about the guy who goes, uh, Slavomir Mrozek, who's a Polish uh, author, uh, when he goes to a Venice film festival and involves, it's called um, Moniza Clavier. He falls in love with this beautiful, you know, Italian actress, but he comes quite literally with a with a luggage, with a suitcase, which is full of, of food because he came on, a, on with no money to Venice. And so wherever he goes, he has to carry this, this luggage because that's his existence, um, but it keeps on interfering with this with this love affair. Um, yeah. And of course, everybody mistakes him for a Russian, which is an even greater insult than being for a Polish. Yeah. And so I, I think that that being you know and, and you if you come as a Jew, you're coming, you're 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 not even a dissident. I mean, so so the part which upset me a little bit about the film was this framing in in terms of. You know, pioneer relationship with a pioneer. What did you feel? You know, were you a dissident or not when you were twelve years old? Oh, yeah. Which only imposed onto people who come from the Soviet Union. I mean, right. what, what's a, what's a requirement to be a dissident of a twelve-year-old? Yeah. There's no other place in the world where we would expect someone to be a dissident at that point. Maybe North Korea, but yeah. it's it's a superimposed narrative yeah. that one has to deal with all the time. Yeah, so, I, that, I, I think that, that that's what's wonderful in her work that she found an off way to deal with that superimposition. Absolutely, she was constantly like, inventing parallel genealogy yeah. to yeah. use Nietzschean words. She wanted different genealogy, right? Exactly. Always, yeah. you know, not do not pigeonhole me. You know, yeah. don't think that you know things about me. But uh, to use this beautiful image of this Polish. Eddie Gray coming to the Venice Film Festival, falling in love with the beautiful movie star. Svetlana, when she emigrated, she was that movie star. If she, if she were in that story, she would be that movie star, right? She would immediately uh, find the most luminous, the most radiant space to occupy, right? She would not allow herself to be uh, reduced to this kind of 
poor immigrant or to pity or you know I never no, said that exactly but that's why that's why I find this the story about the you know once again the story to the Spanish teacher um, is a liberation moment I mean it's just yeah. it's amazing to be that she could be so inventive to, to not allow herself to be captured no, by no. whatever once again the environment would have put absolutely up. refuse state stability yeah. of an identity which can be then because you know, you remember in in Sartre's, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, essay about Jew, the Jews, uh, where he said that the Jew becomes a Jew by being pointed at. Of course, this, there is a limitation, and and this has been criticized. But there is that sense that I don't want you to recognize me. You think you recognize me, this or that, but you you are wrong. You are pointing at the wrong place mm -hmm. because I'm already not there. Exactly, because the moment you you manage to point, pinpoint me, I will I will become yeah. who you yeah. want to date, and so. Yeah, but we know in Yugoslavia that that, and of course in in history of anti-Semitism, Norm knows that many Jews were made into Jews precisely in that on that uh, violent pointing the finger at people who were, you know. Uh, didn't consider themselves necessarily right. There is a certain aggressivity in assigning mm -hmm. an identity, right, and that is what she was always trying to avoid. She was a uh, destinerant in that sense, the Derrida sense, and also um, rhizomatic, right. She moved laterally, and that is why she loved the in 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 the, in, um, in chess terms. She 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 wrote a beautiful essay about the movement of a knight in chess. Which is th three uh, three um, squares up and one <laughs> laterally, right? At, uh, is it two or three? Three and one uh, laterally. So, so she 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 liked that movement, right? One uh, straight and then a little bit off. Um, let me tell you uh, one anecdote. Let's <laughs> try a little bit related to the history of Soviet Union. We were together in Moscow. This was early 90s when they first dumped uh, Dzerzhinsky and all these uh, Stalin statues, uh, um, uh, you know, and then they decided to make a, a park of totalitarianism, which in itself is a problematic way to commemorate Soviet Union, but nonetheless, they made Park, park of Totalitarianism. Svetlana and I are walking and we stop in front of Dzerzhinsky, right, the founder of Cheka, the KGB. And we are walking, looking at there are some graffitis in that Park of Totalitarianism where they parked Dzerzhinsky, they moved him from Lubyanka. And uh, there are three young men come uh, and talk, very well-dressed young, young men, Russians, and one of them says, look, these bastards, Democrats, what they did to our Felix. <laughs> and Svetlana immediately pulls out her block note and writes it down <laughs> and immediately translated it in her book. It's quoted, in, I think, in her book on, on communal uh, department. So she was like that. She was constantly rewriting the conditions, including that of this totalitarian past, right? And we, of course, laughed, not with why they were there, but as we walked away, we had a great laugh about this. So she all she lived, she lived that difficult Dzerzhinsky anti-Semitism, you know. I just show this film at the end of my course, Russian on Russian Jews. And I have a, a few students here, Ariana Meekins, Isabella is here from, from the class. Um, uh, here Ariana is sending us, thumbs up. Um, and we watched, you know, the trajectory of Russian jewelry from let's say 18th century, 19, throughout the 20th century and we finished with this. And I told them I will show you the best Russian Jew ever to emigrate from the Soviet Union. And I showed them Svetlana Boy. She was us, something else and one of a kind. Is there anyone, anyone else wants to share a, a thought? Thank you, Aida. These are very thoughtful remarks. Uh, uh, very thoughtful remarks, yeah. Anyone else? 
Uh, I don't know how long we usually carry these discussions or... Well? If you are pleased with, with this assessment, um, I would have preferred that some of you talked more and uh, said your uh, reflections. Uh, I, I'm no, you know, I don't want to monopolize, but I thank you all then for coming, for staying uh, with us, for watching the film. Please distribute it widely, share it. Uh, Svetlana's work is something that is yet to come. She opened with her work new venues. She, she didn't write in a discipline. She created new discipline. She, she's like a, a ship which opened a new path. So there is a lot of uh, venues that she opened uh, which uh, yet remain to be explored uh, and it's up to us to, to follow her in these tracks. Thank you very much for coming to Dragon, thank you. Uh, we were thank we you. were very lucky to have you to lead this discussion. Thank you, Norman. Um, and, and it was uh, it was quite meaningful. So thank you once again and thanks everyone uh, for coming this evening. Uh, once again uh, our finale for the uh, Gainesville Jewish Film Festival this year is tomorrow night, All See, wonderful story um, about a, an American basketball player who plays for uh, uh, Maccabi Tel Aviv um, and wins the uh, European Championship and then makes Aliyah to Israel. Um, it's good. Um, and, and Roy uh, Holler, our new uh, specialist in Israel studies, uh, will be leading the discussion. So I hope you all can uh, make the film at seven and the discussion, I think at 8.30, Virginia, yeah? Yes, 8.30. Yeah. And, and uh, we'll, we'll see you then. Thank Good you, night, Thank you, Virginia, thank for you. organizing us night after night. Thank you, for, thank you for having us. For joining us. Good night, everybody. Good night.